Welcome back to My Rubber Heart. Today we are going deep into the world of silicon rubber. What makes it chemically unique, how it's manufactured, what you need to keep in mind when formulating it, the best cross-linking methods in use today, and where it finds its place in real-world applications. Let's begin with what makes silicon rubber so different from most other synthetic rubbers. The key lies in its polymer backbone. While conventional rubbers like EPDM, SBR or NBR are based on carbon-carbon chains, silicon rubber is built on a siloxate backbone, composed of an alternating silicon and oxygen atoms with organic side groups, most commonly methyl groups attached to the silicon. This gives you the basic structure, polydimethyl siloxane, or PDMS. This silicon-oxygen-silicon structure is what gives silicon its extraordinary thermal and oxidative stability. The bond synergy of a silicon-oxygen bond is much higher than that of a carbon-carbon bond, which means it doesn't degrade nearly as easily under heat, UV light or ozone. That is why silicon rubber can remain flexible at temperatures as low as minus 60 degrees Celsius and retain its properties up to 250 degrees Celsius or more, depending on formulation. Now, let's talk about how silicon rubber is produced. The base polymer is synthesized by hydrolysis and condensation of chlorosilanes, typically starting from methyl chlorosilanes, which are derived from elemental silicone and methyl chloride. These are reacted to form siloxane chains, and through controlled polymerization, you end up with a silicon polymer with the desired molecular weight and functionality. This base polymer is then compounded with reinforcing fillers, cross-linking agents, and additives to create the silicon rubber compound. Formulating silicon rubber is not quite the same as working with carbon-based elastomers. The most critical component is the filler system. The raw silicon gum by itself is extremely soft and weak. To give it mechanical strength, fumed silica is added. This is a highly surface active form of silica with a massive surface area that interacts with the polymer to create reinforcement. However, too much fumed silica or poorly dispersed silica can result in poor processability and instability. So it's often treated with surface modifiers like siloxanes or silanes to improve its compatibility. Another must-have in silicone compounding is careful moisture and contamination control. Because of the reactivity of the curing systems, contamination with amines, sulfur compounds, peroxides from previous runs, or even traces of water can inhibit or destabilize the cure. This is particularly important for addition cure system, which rely on a platinum catalyst. That brings us to cure packages. There are two main commercial curing systems used in silicon rubber, peroxide curing and addition curing, also known as platinum catalyzed systems. Peroxide curing is still widely used, especially for high consistency rubber or HCR grades. It relies on the use of organic peroxides, like decumyl peroxides or DBPH, which generate free radicals that promote cross-linking between the metal groups or vinyl side groups on the PDMS chains. This system is robust, well understood and cost-effective. However, it comes with one drawback. It produces byproducts which can affect the rubber's final performance, smell or cause blooming. That's why a post-cure at high temperature is almost always required, especially for food grade or medical silicone, to drive out these residuals and stabilize the network. The alternative is addition curing, used more often for liquid silicone rubber, or LSR, and medical grades. Here, a platinum catalyst drives a reaction between vinyl functional PDMS and a silicone hydride crosslinker, forming silicone carbon crosslinks. The advantage of this method is that it's clean, so no byproducts are formed, and it cures fast and at relatively low temperatures, which makes it ideal for injection molding and thin walled medical components. The downside is sensitivity. The platinum catalyst can be poisoned by contamination, and inhibitors must often be added to control cure speed and shelf stability. 
If you are crosslinking silicone rubber, addition curing with platinum is by far the cleanest and fastest method in commercial use today, especially for precision parts, medical products, or food contact items. Peroxide systems still dominate in industrial and automotive applications, where slight byproducts presence isn't a critical concern and cost may be a bigger factor. Now, where do we actually use silicone rubber? Thanks to its thermal stability, low temperature flexibility, biocompatibility and electrical insulating properties, it is found in a huge variety of sectors. In automotive, it's used for turbocharger hoses, ignition cables and gaskets because it holds up under the hood where temperature fluctuates and oils are present. In electronics, it's prized for potting, encapsulating and insulating components due to its dielectric properties and resistance to tracking and arc. In the medical field, silicone is used for tubing, catheters and implants because it's inert, non-toxic and easily sterilized. The food and consumer goods industries use it for baking molds, bottle nipples, seals and spatulas, basically anything that must withstand high heat and come into contact with skin or food. And in construction, it's used in high-end sealants and weatherproofing systems. That's the story of silicone rubber, a material whose unusual chemistry makes it indispensable where other rubbers just can't survive. From its siloxane backbone to its platinum catalyzed cures and heat-defying stability, it's a class of elastomer that truly stands apart. Thank you for joining me on my rubber heart. If this episode helped you understand why silicone rubber behaves the way it does, drop a like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments if you've worked with it yourself or where you think it's being underused. Until next time, stay elastic and stay curious.